two rows into this. I have my other little thing I just like, and you can see the meaning that it is there. Ah, uh, rubber tip. There we go. Okay, so I'm just checking my rubber. This is one with no sound, and this is one with no sound. 
for me. I wasn't exactly sure what to, uh, how, how to set this up when Jay invited me. He just said, come give some lectures. And I wasn't sure if they were classroom lectures or just a standard lectures. So I probably what I have here is kind of a mix in between. Um, and the topic originally was going to be dynamics, but I thought maybe the first day I would do something not dynamic. Because another area that I work in is um, non-point pollution control. So I've been doing a lot of work on permit trading over the years. And um, have a couple of papers here I thought would be nice to get warmed up before we get to the dynamics. But one theme that runs through all of this, papers I'll talk about today and also the papers over the next two days, um, is the idea that the world isn't perfect and we have to deal with these imperfections. And so we have to deal, come up with some sort of second best approaches usually to, to manage environmental problems. And so all the work I'm gonna be presenting is based on this theme of second best. In this paper today I'll be talking about, I'll actually be talking about two papers. Um, this is work I did with James, Jim Shortle at Penn State. So how do I get rid of that thing on the top? Okay. So nutrient pollution is one of the uh, biggest sources of water pollution in the country and really around the world, uh, especially for freshwater and coastal ecosystems. And this is just a, a map that some uh, researchers did to show you uh, coastal impacts of nutrient uh, problems. And you can see they're pretty spread out over the world, a lot in the, in the US, Gulf of Mexico, and now along the Eastern seaboard. A whole lot in Europe, a lot of problems, increasing problems in Asia, and even some down in South America now, they're just expanding. And all these problems, agriculture is a major source. Uh, and one of the reasons is that it's, it's largely unregulated. Nobody in the world seems to want to regulate agriculture. So what they do is they, instead they put more and more stringent and costly regulations on point sources because they're sort of easy to control. And there's political uh, will to control them, whereas there's not for ag. But what it results in is a misallocation of controls. You've got the point source costs going up, 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 and the non-point costs are still really low because nobody's really done anything about them. Well, they've come to find out that emissions trading programs could be a way to include non-point sources. Basically, the point source would pay the non-point source to reduce their emissions and create a credit or an offset that the point source no longer has to admit, can, can no, no longer has to abate quite as much. And so this is a way of reallocating controls to produce uh, cost savings. I think we're getting some tools here. Okay, thank you. All right, perfect, thank you. So EPA in 2005 uh, implemented national uh, water quality trading rules for point non-point trading. Uh, the way it works is point sources are regulated through the MPDES permit system. This is done independently or exogenously of any point non-point trading system. So these permits have already been set in another context. That'll become important in just a minute. The question then is what to trade and how do these trades occur? The problem with non-point emissions, if you're not familiar with them, is that they're unobservable. It's usually runoff from a field, like a farm field, driven by rain events, which are highly stochastic. Uh, and it's diffuse. It runs off not, not in a point, but all over the place. So how do you measure this? Generally, we can't measure it very well. And so what is actually traded is actual point source emissions for reductions in estimated non-point emissions. They use models. They use mathematical models to predict if you change pra certain practices on your land, what is that going to translate into in terms of mean emissions from your land? And the trades are based on this. Now, these are imperfect substitutes. They're not, you're not trading the same thing. Actual emissions versus mean estimated emissions. If damages are convex, um, the uncertainty associated with non-point emissions and their abatement, it's really costly. So that's the problem. Well, trade ratios have been developed to address these concerns, or sometimes they're called uncertainty ratios. This defines the units of estimated non-point emissions that a point source has to buy to increase its emissions by one unit. A large ratio is going to make it expensive for point sources to buy non-point emissions, right? If you have got to trade at a two to one ratio or three to one ratio, it means I'm buying 
maybe two or three units of non-point emissions in order to re reduce my abatement by one unit. That, that's pretty costly. But in any case, uh, these ratios are regarded as the most important policy choice in these programs. Actually, it's the only choice that they have because the permits have already been set. The only question now is how do we encourage trading? I got a typo down there. Uh, in practice, these, univer these ratios universally exceed one. They're all like two to three. I've even seen some as high as four or five. This is not the result of any formal economic analysis. Uh, EPA believes that we need a high ratio because of the non-point uncertainty. They think that you're substituting certain point source controls for uncertain non-point source controls. You know what you're getting with the point sources, but you're not quite sure what you're getting with the non-point sources in terms of the control. And it's heresy to suggest otherwise. I've been in, in meetings where I've suggested they need ratios less than one, and they've called me a heretic. So this should just say, this is the wrong perspective. Um, the problem is there's risk even when non-point sources don't impose any controls. This is all created by uh, stochastic weather events. If I do nothing on my farm, there's a whole lot of vari variability in the weather that's driving runoff off my farm, and I've got a lot of variation in that runoff. That runoff is causing damages already. So that risk, the costly risk, is already out there. By doing nothing, we leave the risk in the system. But there is also this idea that what you do on your farm to control that risk is also uncertain. We don't know exactly how much of an effect an investment in certain abatement practices is going to have. So there's two types of risk. So the theory says if non-point controls increase the uncertainty due to control effectiveness, which is what we show over here, the abatement effort goes up and non-point emissions variability is going up, then we want a larger ratio because this, uns this added uncertainty is costly. If the non-point controls reduce uncertainty, so here we have, you know, if you do nothing, you've got all this variation because of stochastic rainfall and so forth, but as we abate more, there's less runoff and maybe less variability, we'd want a smaller ratio. Which effect dominates is an, it's, it, well, risk here is endogenous. Which effect dominates is an empirical question. It's going to depend uh, on program design. I'm going to show you this in a minute here. So what we do in this paper is we examine risk-cost trade-offs. Prior work focuses on equilibrium results in a first best setting where they, they're choosing optimal permit numbers and the trade ratio. There's no analysis of risk-cost trade-offs in, the, in these papers. They're just looking at equilibrium outcomes. We're going to examine these trade-offs. We're also going to look at second best programs where these non-point emissions have not been regulated and the point source emissions have, have been regulated, but they're exogenous. We're not choosing the permits. So you can see right off the bat, the first best requires optimal permit numbers and trade ratios. You've got two instruments. In reality, we only have one instrument to choose from because the permits have already been chosen. And we're going to look at this in an application of the Susquehanna River Basin in Pennsylvania. This is the largest contributor of nutrients to the Chesapeake Bay, which is the largest estuary in the United States. Uh, this is a map of the Susquehanna River Basin, and you can see that most of it lies in Pennsylvania. And um, most of the nutrients are generated in Pennsylvania. I couldn't tell you the percentage, but it's, it's the vast majority comes out of Pennsylvania. So here's the model. And I sent these slides out uh, to Dave earlier, uh, a day or two ago. So uh, hopefully you have these if you're curious. But the point sources, uh, here's their emissions. It's equal to their unregulated emissions, which we call E0, minus their abatement, Z, uh, the point source. These are going to be models deterministic. Their abatement costs are just a function of how much abatement they uh, invest in. The non-point source emissions are stochastic. They depend on, this is their mean unregulated. We multiply that by a, a random variable epsilon. We subtract off a mean component for abatement, but it's multiplied by a random variable epsilon, f plus d. Expected value here looks the same as with the point sources. So we still have this mean value, unregulated level minus your abatement, and the costs are a function of the mean abatement. So when you're making choices to, 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 to implement some abatement, 
Uh, this is just a restricted cost function. We can't base it on actual abatement because we can't measure that. But ex ante, we can, we can figure out what the mean might be and we can base costs on that mean. Damages are convex um, and ambient pollution is causing damages. It's just the sum of the emissions from the different sources. And we're just gonna model these polluters as just two aggregate sources, just to keep it really simple. Let's look at non-point source variability. So the, uh, the, vari the, uh, the variance of epsilon naught is the pre-abatement variability. The variance of Z, epsilon Z, is what we would call the abatement variability. And the, there's a covariance between the two, which we're gonna assume is positive. It's been shown in the literature that this should be positive because these are correlated based on stochastic events and certain types of uncertainties. And we're gonna impose that the mean abatement should be less than the mean uh, unregulated level of, of emissions. So the riskiness of non-point abatement is gonna depend on the sign of the marginal variance of emissions with respect to abatement. <coughs> If, if your abatement goes up and the variance goes up, it's a risky, um, non-point abatement is risky. If the variance goes down, the non-point abatement is risk reducing uh, activity. Well, let's look at the variance. We can calculate the variance of, of emissions and then we can calculate the marginal variation. And we see that it's a function of our mean abatement choice. So that means the sign of this variation term, this variance term is endogenous. It's gonna depend on how much abatement effort we apply. The variance is increasing. The risk, economic risk, you know, it, it depends on the damage impacts. And so if you have convex damages, having more variability in your emissions is gonna create, uh, it's gonna create the risk. No. So, so the mean should go up or down? I'm just trying to get my head wrapped around. So mean, the mean of a mean, down, uh, the, 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 Here's the mean of emissions. Where is it at? Yeah, here's sorry. Here's the mean of emissions. It's just it's just this. So each of these each of these stochastic terms has a has an expected value of one. Yeah. Pardon me. B will reduce the mean, but it could increase the variance. Yeah. We're just keeping it simple. And the, reason, the reason we're doing this and I'll, is because if you look at the literature, they've essentially assumed in the past that the sign of this is fixed and constant. There's been no discussion before about the endogeneity of this. Can, can changes in, in effort level affect the variation? It hasn't been discussed really. We've sort of ignored it. So because, of, because this depends on abatement, this term, um, this term would be negative, which means Z would be a, um, abatement would be risk reducing whenever abatement is smaller than some threshold level that we can define uh, as a ratio of, of the covariance to the variance of, of abatement times your unregulated level of emissions. So it's risk reducing at small levels of abatement. It could be risk increasing at higher levels of abatement. If this value, this coefficient of ratio of covariance to the variance is greater than one, that means this term is always gonna be negative and, and this is, abatement is always gonna be risk reducing. There's gonna be no threshold. Some hydrologists think this is the case, but we're so gonna ignore them for the time being and because policymakers care so much about abatement risks, we're gonna assume that there is a threshold and um, 
we're just going to set this value in our numerical example. We're going to start off our baseline case setting this value equal to a half. So that means there will be a threshold uh, in the model. Where you are at, right, right. We don't specifically deal with that. We just we're just assuming a convex damage function. So, the magnitude of risk can change as at, you know depending on how much ambient pollution there is in the system. Like you say, if the curvature changes, then yeah, the level of risk is going to change. We're just saying we're just assuming convexity. That's just that just means that. You don't want variation. I'm going to start with this descent. Now, so now that we understand sort of the, the hydrology portion of this, we're just going to look at the decentralized permit market first. We have two classes of permits. You've got point source permits and non-point permits. Um, sources could hold. For simplicity, as I mentioned, we're just going to assume two aggregate sources. You've got a point source and a non-point source. Implicitly, we're saying that trades within a category are going to occur to one-to-one -one ratio, uh, sort of like they do in, in most uh, permit markets. The market's competitive. Type one polluters post-trade, their net costs after trading is given by this relationship. Here's our abatement costs, and then here's the cost of our net permit purchases. Uh, this could be this is likely going to be a positive value for point sources who are buying permits from non-point sources. It could be, it's going to be a negative value for non-point sources who are selling their permits to, uh, to point sources. So this would be a source of revenue for them. Here we have the price of the permit. We have um, their initial unregulated emissions and minus their abatement. So this is their post-trade emissions. We subtract from that their pre-trade permit allocation. So if they increase emissions above their permit allocation, then they have to buy permits. Basically all that's saying. And the trade ratio, as I mentioned before, is just the number of permits required to increase point source emissions by one unit. Uh, we're gonna call that T. This is just the terms of trade, basically. We have two market conditions that, that apply here. We have an equilibrium condition, which is that uh, T should equal the ratio of the permit prices which in equilibrium should equal the ratio of marginal cost between these sources. So T is defined the relative price of point source permits in the market equilibrium. Policymaker will set T, but then the market should adjust so that the relative price of these permits should equal that trading ratio. So if they're a very high T, what you're doing effectively is you're, you're, you're creating a very relatively large price for point source permits. We also have a market clearing condition. Here is the, uh, the supply of permits, the endowments. Now I'm, I'm dividing this one by T because I'm putting all these endowments in the same units. They're all in terms of point source permits. This is the, this is the actual point source emissions. This is the non-point emissions denominated in, certain, in terms of point source emissions. So we've just converted everything to point source units for now so we can have this market clearing condition. And what you'll see here is that T here affects the endowment. There will be an endowment effect here. And this is like a problem where you have uh, consumers maximizing their utility subject to some uh, income endowment where, where um, or some sort of an initial endowment where the value of that endowment is gonna depend on relative prices. So we get a price effect here through T. If we change T, we're gonna change this relative price of these, of these permits, which will change the marginal cost. But we can also have an endowment effect here that changes basically our, 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 uh, the value of the endowment that we're, that we're handing out. I'll talk about more of that with the next paper. So the, there's two effects. The price effect, a larger T increases the relative price of point source permits. The endowment effect, the larger T effectively reduces the number of non-point source permits. Just the permanent endowment. We're, we're going to 
be more interested in the effect of T on this, on this response. So for point sources, if you increase T, uh, it's going to increase abatement. You do have a price effect. As I mentioned, uh, if you increase T, increases the relative price of point source permits, becomes more costly uh, for, the non, for, the, for the point source to um, basically buy more rights to abate, they don't, so they'll have to abate less. So have to, uh, I'm sorry. Sorry, it's more costly for them to emit more, they're gonna have to abate, they're gonna have to abate more. The endowment effect has a, has, a, has a reinforcing effect for them. For non-point sources, actually you get opposing effects. The price effect is gonna be the opposite of the price effect that we had for the, for the point source. It's gonna be uh, better for them to sell their permits. But this endowment effect means they're gonna have fewer permits to sell effectively. And that's gonna create a, a, an opposing effect. And if we look at the response functions, holding this permit level fixed, E hat, and right here, we're just showing you E hat evaluated at the first best level. You have to pick a value. So we're just choosing the first best level because this will be helpful for later on. And we're varying T here along this axis. What you see is the point source abatement is what we would expect. It's, it's increasing in T. As we make it more expensive for them to buy permits, you're going to abate more. The non-point response is interesting. It actually goes up at first because this endowment effect dominates. And then past some threshold level, it's going to go back down like we would expect. So this is the partial effect of T on abatement. So the planner's problem, now that we understand the response functions, here's the planner's problem. We're gonna look at the first best case first. Here's the reduction in damages from, from uh, management of pollution. This is the expected benefits. And here's our costs, just the abatement costs. Really here, we're just choosing epsilon or e, e hat PS, just the permit levels for the point sources, because we assume that the uh, point sources are, are regulated initially while the non-point sources are not. So for the first best case, we actually are gonna choose the permit level for the point sources. We're still gonna assume that non-point sources aren't regulated. Doesn't really matter here. We still have one instrument here for the point sources, which is fine. And we're gonna choose the trading ratio. The first order condition for any U uh, where u is either p e, either of these choice variables is going to look like this. So you'll get your marginal damages times the effect of abatement on emissions times the effect of the policy parameter on your mar or your mean abatement level. The only thing that to notice here is that the expectation here for point sources is separated from this effect, this marginal effect of abatement on emissions. For non-point sources. We can't separate that very easily because this is emissions for, this should be non-point sources. These emissions are stochastic. Sorry, I didn't change the notation. This should be E not NPS and this is Z NPS. This E is stochastic. So we can't just pull this out and separate and have two expectations. There. There's gonna be a covariance term and that'll arise in a minute. So what we're gonna to wanna to do here really, since we have two instruments and I've got two brackets in here, I'm just gonna choose each instrument in a way that sets these brackets equal, to, the terms inside the brackets equal to zero. So we satisfy our first order condition. So we're gonna set the permit level for the point sources such that the marginal abatement cost for point sources equals their marginal damages. And we're gonna set T such that the marginal I just copied this. This should be the marginal non-point cost. Abatement cost equals the marginal impact of uh, non-point abatement on damages. And if I just take the ratio of these things, what I get is the ratio of marginal abatement cost. Take the, I'm gonna get my trading ratio so that I can tell you what the trading ratio should actually be here in this case. So it's just the ratio of, uh, marginal damage impacts uh, by, by non-point sources to that of or point sources to that of non-point sources. Boy, my notation is screwed up, I'm sorry. This should be a PS here. I got my NPSs right down here finally. This is just copying and pasting. I'm getting used to this new equation that are in Word. And uh, anyway, we can simplify this. It's expected damages 
divided by our expected damages down here minus a covariance term. This accounts for the nonpoint risk. The sine of this term, the covariance term, is equal to the sine of that marginal variance impact that we talked about earlier. So if this is uh, decreasing risk, if more abatement is decreasing the risk, the variance is going down. This is a negative term. We're taking a negative in front of that covariance. This whole thing becomes positive, and this ratio then becomes less than one. So we have two positive terms in the bottom. Uh, the ratio is less than one, and uh, whenever non-point abatement is risk reducing. If this term is positive, so that abatement is risk increasing, uh, we're going to end up with the ratio greater than one. So the sign is endogenous. This gives us z star than or greater than this threshold level that we talked about before. It depends on this, the endogenous sign of this variance term. Again, in previous literature, people have derived this equation, but there really hasn't been any discussion about how different levels of abatement might change the sign of this thing. You could learn by abating. Not close, what do you mean closing the variance? Yeah, we would like the variance, the variance to be smaller. Yeah. Well, you're not learning per se. I mean, it's, it could be, oops. It could be that it's an optimal thing to have to have abatement be risk increasing. This is the optimal trading ratio, this, this relationship. And really, um, I mean, what we're doing is we're solving some first, excuse me, some first order conditions. Depending on the solution of those first order conditions, you're gonna get some abatement levels. And those abatement levels are either gonna be such that, that Z is Z star is greater than or less than this threshold level. So if abatement is optimal, if it's optimal to have a lot of non-point abatement, maybe it's really, really, really costly to, to, to abate in the point sources. So you wanna have more abatement among non-point sources. Maybe we do go above the threshold. Maybe that's an optimal thing. So the point is we can't a priori say that the trading ratio should be greater than one or less than one, we've actually got to solve these conditions and figure out, is it an optimal thing for the trading ratio to be greater than or less than one? In practice, as I said, they're all two to three. It seems to me to be a very large value when there are cases at least where we could say this should be less than one. This covariance term? Yeah, you're trying to sign this, but you can show it should be equal to the sign of this. No, it's assuming that D prime of A is, it's assuming that uh, damages are convex. All you need is convexity. Convexity is enough to show that these signs have to be the same. Yeah, we can show that pretty rigorously. Um, I didn't do that here because there's enough math. But yeah, it's been, that's been shown. Jim Shorrell actually showed that back in 1987. He did a paper and he showed this. So, so this is what I just said to Jay. Um, the policy variables are jointly determined. Um, most, poly, most studies on point non-point trading, as I mentioned earlier, they focus on T. They ignore the importance of E hat, this, the permit levels. They just look at choosing T. So I want to compare. I showed you before a case where we had E hat fixed at the first best level, and I showed you how those response functions worked as we changed T, as we changed the trading ratio. I'm going to look a little bit now at how things might change um, as we change, um, as, we, as, we, as we look at the optimal, the first best value of this E hat. So the first thing I'm going to do is go back to this problem that we have, this management problem, this planner's problem. 
And I'm just going to optimize with respect to E hat. What if you just optimize with respect to E hat? Then when you solve that first order condition, you're going to get a response function for E hat. It's going to be a function of T. And if we look at that response function, we can see that as T increases, the E hat function changes considerably. It's not fixed. This is the first best level right here, where if we hold it fixed, it's going to be here at about 12. But as we change T, that function initially is much less than 12. And as we go way above T, it goes up to 20 something. It's very responsive to changes in T. So this is the response curve I showed you earlier, the partial response to T. If we held E hat fixed and just allowed T to change, this is what we get. If we allow E hat to be a function of T and then we allow T to change, this is the total response to T. And now it looks very much like your standard results. Non-point abatement goes up as you increase T, but non-point or point source abatement goes up, non-point abatement is coming down which is what we sort of would expect to happen. As T goes up, you have more trading. These guys abate more, these guys abate less. They're trading credits to these guys. What happens if we look at social net benefits under these two cases? Here's the response. Here's the case where we allow E hat to respond. We get a permit response and we change T we can see that we get this maximum here at T star. Uh, and in our first best model, actually you can see here T star is about 0.6. But we're allowing in our model, I'll get to our, our numerical model in a minute, but we're allowing there to be risk uh, increasing abatement versus risk reducing abatement. It's endogenous where that's at. And we find the T star is where that abatement is risk reducing for non-point sources. So it's much less than the existing ratios. And you can see that uh, even if we go up to much higher ratios of two to three, like you see in practice, there's a dip down in social net benefits, but it's, it's, mar it's relatively small, 35 million to 30 million. I mean, it's, it's a big number, but it's proportionally, it's very small. What happens if we fix E hat like they do in existing programs where E hat is just exogenous? Now, as we change T, Social net benefits peak at the same spot, but then they dip down and they're negative. So the fact that we have in practice a fixed exogenous E hat permit levels is really important. So now I want to look at the trade-offs associated with the choice of T. Again, going back to this uh, social net benefit function, but now I've plugged in these, res these response functions for E hat into this problem. And um, I'm going to take a derivative with respect to T to see what the trade off, the marginal effects would be as you increase T or as you change T. Note that no trading occurs when T is large. If, again, T is very large, it's going to be very expensive for the point sources to buy non point permits. They're not going to want to do that. And so there'll be no trading. The benefits from trading really come from reductions in T. And so I'm going to analyze the change in social net benefits for a negative change in T. Just to make it so that when you look at T getting smaller, you can think in your head, well, this should be where there's more trading going on. The market is ex should be expanding somehow. Now, the form, it turns out the form of this derivative should be the same either for an optimal first best response or an exogenous first best response, which is nice. It's helpful because when we analyze first best and second best trade-offs, the, the form of, the, of, the, uh, this, of this relationship is going to be the same first best and second best. The reason is that if ET, E hat is set optimally, the envelope there is going to ensure that the trade-offs only reflect the partial effects, right? And if E hat is fixed, then the trade-offs also only reflect the partial effects. There's no change in, 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 in E hat. So this means we're going to expect over much of the range, after we looked at our response function before, over much of the range of T, we're going to expect this thing to be positive. The endowment effect is going to drive the trade-offs here not the price effect. 
So if you take the derivative with respect to t, it's going to be proportional to this expression here. I'm going to show you what each of these components are. But basically what I did was I took the first best, uh, the optimality conditions, and I scaled them. I divided by some, some variables just to make them a little bit simpler to interpret. And they become a relative marginal net benefit terms or you could think of them as a rate of return condition since they're really not in dollar terms anymore since you divide through by some dollar values. But still, this is terms here as the marginal net benefits of the mean cost impacts if, if I increase T or decrease T. There's gonna be some cost impacts uh, occurring that I'm gonna show you what those are in a second. And here we have some marginal net costs of, of non-point risk impacts. So we're gonna be able to sort of weight the cost impacts versus the risk impacts. Now, optimally, this term is going to be one set equal to zero. And that's typically what's done. I'll show you that in a minute, but we're not always going to look at whether that's equal to zero because we, have, we actually want to develop some marginal benefit and marginal cost curves. That always helps us to interpret things, right? And in the past, in the literature, they haven't done that. They've just gone straight to the equilibrium. So this first term with cost MPS this is the negative of the difference between the marginal cost for point sources and non-point sources um, divided by the marginal cost of, non -point, or of point sources. And in a market equilibrium, it's actually going to equal this, 1 over t minus 1. It'll be just a fixed value for any given t. And this just is because of the way the market happens. We said you know, these co marginal cost ratios should adjust uh, to reflect t. So regardless of what these values are and what our current level of t is, it should always equal this thing, which makes life a little bit simpler. Now, the standard argument for permit trading is that the benefits are going to stem from reallocating abatement from point sources to non-point sources. Non -point so the point source abatement costs at the margin are very high, non-point source abatement costs at the margin are very low, and so there's some gap there and there's some benefits to, to trading. But this term is negative when the marginal cost of point sources exceeds that of non-point sources. And because, sorry, because this term is, is positive, we have a negative out here, it means this term here would be negative. And that means it's a cost. It means reducing T, which you would think would be increasing trading between these sources, is actually uh, a cost. And the reason is because these partial effects of T is going to reduce non-point abatement and increase this marginal abatement cost difference at the margin. In, in reality, um, you know, as you increase T enough, I mean, there should be more trading that goes on, but at the margin, um, with the partial effects that are going on, they're gonna dominate, not the total effects, but the partial effects, this thing becomes a cost. That's the opposite of conventional wisdom. I don't know what is going on with my slides. All right. This is this term, but this should be PS here. Sorry about this. I, I have tried so hard. This is a lot of notation to be typing in. <coughs> this is really what this term is. So just ignore this part. This second, this bracketed term here is going to be positive. The point source is a buyer of permits. This is their actual emissions after trading minus their endowment. This is going to be positive. And as we said, we're looking at partial effects of Z for non-point ab abatement and with respect to T, and this is a positive term. So this whole term is positive. So the sign of this term is gonna depend on this first term. It's gonna depend on the, really the difference between marginal abatement costs for point sources and the marginal damages of, those, of, the of, of point source emissions. That wedge between the two is an efficiency loss. Remember in the first best outcome, we want that thing to be equal. We want those two terms to be the same. But when you're away from the equilibrium, we're looking at things at the margin, that's not going to be equal. And there's going to be a wedge uh, created and causing an efficiency loss. 
So when t is equal to t star, this term will equal zero, but otherwise uh, this will be marginal abatement cost will be greater than d when t is too big because you'll have too much point source abatement. It'll be less, this will be negative when t is too small. And so there's benefits to reducing t to reduce point source abatement in this case uh, when, when t is too big. And so at the margin, um, you know, the marginal effect is going to depend on the level of t that you're currently at. But if assuming t is too big, if we're starting up with a very large t and looking at, at the reductions in t, initially at, less, at least, um, this, will be, uh, this will be a wedge and there'll be some benefit to, uh, to reducing t. The last term is a risk term. And again, this equals the negative of the covariance. And so this our covariance term comes back into play. And a positive value here uh, is going to imply a social cost because we're subtracting it. So this term here is written with a negative here, but there's another negative up here just because I wanted to look at benefits, some balance there. And so we can as now the sign of the covariance term is the opposite of that marginal variance term. So a smaller t is going to increase nonpoint risks when uh, abatement of nonpoint sources is risk reducing. So when this term is negative, when abatement is risk reducing, then we have a negative covariance plus a negative here that makes this term positive and that implies a social cost. So it's sort of an, again, a counterintuitive result that at the margin, when nonpoint abatement is risk reducing, uh, having a lower ratio which the total effect of which would be to have more trading, the marginal effect is a cost because of that partial effect that I mentioned earlier. The partial effect on t of t on changing nonpoint ab abatement. Now in a first best equilibrium, we can move that risk cost term over the other side and the middle term, as I said, will disappear there'll be no more wedge between marginal abatement costs and marginal damages for point sources. That term disappears. What we're left with is a, is a um, balancing these non-point cost savings with the risk that occurs through non-point source abatement. Now, if there's no risk, the right-hand side term would vanish would set t equal to one, the left hand side term would also vanish. But if you have risk, that right hand side term is not going to vanish. And so what we have is the sign of this wedge between marginal abatement costs for point and non-point sources is going to equal the sign of this covariance term, which is the same as the sign of that marginal risk term. So allocating more controls to non-point sources is going to produce marginal cost savings and risks. So we get cost savings when this is positive, we get risk when this is positive. You get marginal cost savings and risk, or we're going to reduce nonpoint risk, but at greater marginal cost. You can't have both. And in, in, in practice, what they've been sort of trying to do is have both. They think, well, let's trade, that'll reduce costs, and let's have a really large ratio to re help reduce risks. But you can't get both. You can get one or the other. There are trade offs here. We can look at these trade-offs out of equilibrium by developing these curves. Uh, this curve here, just ignore this one for now. I couldn't really delete it from this slide. This is done in Mathematica long before. But um, this term here is the sum of those, those co mean cost effect terms. This is the marginal net benefits of reducing T in terms of mean abatement cost impact. So here's T and it's getting smaller. Here is, is four, three, two, one, downward sloping. You could expect a marginal benefit curve to be. We have our risk, our marginal risk cost term. This is a positive term, which means it's, it's actually reflecting some risk. I can't tell here. I think it's slightly upward sloping, but very minimally so. And uh, you'll see the, they intersect here, uh, t below one. This was our first best result, that t is below one. This term here does not intersect the horizontal axis. Now, as I said, we do have a threshold here for uh, if there's enough abatement, uh, non-point abatement could become uh, risk increasing. 
but we don't actually have that. I don't know what that is. So we, we actually never get, for these, at least for these values of t, we never get to the point where a non-point abatement would be risking, re, risk reduce, uh, sorry, risk, uh, risk increasing. It's only going to be risk reducing here within the relevant region of t. Even though we allowed for it to be risk increasing, we don't actually see a case in this scenario where it would be risk uh, reducing or risk increasing. And that's simply due to the response functions don't allow a non-point abatement to get large enough to have that risk increasing response. So this is when this ratio here, I've, I've inverted it, but the ratio of abatement uh, variability to the covariance term is two. Um, we're having a lot of, we're having quite a bit of abatement variability, but still only at two is maybe not extreme yet. I'm going to show you a case in a minute where it's a lot larger. But again, the idea here is that reducing t, we benefit from these, as we reduce t, we benefit from these marginal cost impacts at the expense of increased nonpoint risk. And again, this is the opposite of sort of the conventional wisdom out there. Now, if I increase this, this term here to a much larger value, eight and a half, now we're getting a, quite a bit of nonpoint abatement risk we actually see this curve rotates and now intersects the uh, x-axis. And, and this curve rotates as well. So the, the risk term rotates down and the risk threshold arises where it crosses the axis. The cost term benefits rotate to reflect the fact that there's greater expected damages due to this risk. Expected damages go up when there's more risk. So that's gonna increase the slope of this thing and, and it's going to increase t. t was here. Now you can see t is much closer to 1. Actually, I think I've chosen this value so that t is right about at 1. You see, I've had to increase by, almost, by more than a factor of 4, this level of risk, to get t to go up to even 1. Now, hydrologists, as I mentioned, don't even think this thing should be greater than 1. So I'm getting up there. Now, I've increased t. T star, and I want to mention this is tempered by the response e, e hat star of T. Remember, permits are responding. We're still looking at the first best case. I'm allowing my permit levels to respond as T changes. So even though we're sort of measuring the partial effects uh, in terms of the marginal impacts, there is still this response function that's embedded here in these, in these relationships. And those, that, that value changes, and it changes the of this curve. This is what I already said. Planner's problem uh, for the second best. Now we're just going to look at T and we're going to hold E fixed. It's some inefficient value. I'm going to assume the point sources initially are underregulated, that the permit levels are 25% too high. Now, in practice, we think, we think point sources are heavily underregulated. We think this whole sector is heavily underregulated, to be honest. Um, and when I say permit levels, are underregulated too high, you have to remember this permit level has to be enough to manage both the point and the non-point sources. So in, ex in current markets, uh, in current, under current such settings, we have way too much nutrient pollution going into the Chesapeake Bay, the Gulf of Mexico, I mean, all over the world. There's just way too much nutrient pollution, which suggests that in aggregate, over all the sources, we're highly underregulating emissions. So this 25% too high is really, even though we're saying it's for the point sources, uh, for their permit level, remember that permit level is really what's regulating the entire system because I'm only using non-point or point source permits initially. We're assuming the non-point source is unregulated initially. So 25% really isn't that big of a deal. I should say these assumptions now matter and I'm going to get into this in the next paper. Uh, because the second best outcome is going to depend on the permit allocation. First best outcome doesn't depend on the permit allocation. I'll show that too in the next paper. doesn't matter where you allocate permits, you're going to trade to the first best with no transactions cost. 
Second best is starts to matter. Things depend on this initial permit allocation. All my marginal benefit and marginal cost curves are going to depend on what we've assumed for this permit allocation. So what happens is this curve here, and I don't have the other one to compare to on the same screen, but this curve here has rotated up even more. It was probably about here with, with this value of two, actually it was about, about right through here. It's rotated up, up here quite a bit. This curve used to be slightly downward sloping, ever so slightly. Now it's actually increasing. We have a slightly larger trading ratio um, than before as a result of these changes. But the reason these curves rotate uh, significantly, more, they ro the reason they rotate um, and give you the larger ratio in part is because we don't have, well, it's completely because we don't have this permit response anymore. There's no longer a permit response changing as T changes. We hold this fixed and now the trade ratio is gonna have to do more. If we look at the equilibrium, this term in the middle here, as I mentioned before, can no longer be, before it was zero in the first best outcome, it's no longer gonna be zero. This wedge is gonna remain. This difference between point source marginal costs and marginal damages is gonna remain. Because we don't have any permit choices to manage that relationship. The trade ratio now has to do a couple things. It has to manage relative prices and it has to manage endowments. Previously, even though there was an endowment effect for that marginal impact, um, it was effectively the permit levels that managed the endowments. And it was the trading ratio that managed the relative prices. We had two, uh, we have two externalities, point and non-point. We have two instruments in the first best case. Everything gets managed nice and cleanly. That's the Tinbergen rule. You have the same number, same number of instruments as you do externalities, you can manage the system very well. When you start to reduce the number of instruments, now the remaining instruments have to do more than one thing and they can't do both efficiently. So the second best trading ratio looks a little different. We have the same numerator. This part is the same in the denominator, but we're adding this effect in the denominator, which is this wedge between marginal abatement costs for point sources and the marginal damages. And that's what we call a, a second best adjustment. Whenever you have second best problems, and you look at pricing of those, of those externalities, there's usually an adjustment term in there. You see this when you're talking about managing monopolies, when you're managing uh, ecological problems, the same sort of uh, second best issues arise. With too many permits out there, that adjustment is gonna be negative. The ratio is gonna be larger than otherwise, and that's the, what that's gonna do then is it's gonna to try to reduce the effective number of permits, which will help bring this, uh, adjustment is negative. Sorry. Yeah, so the negative is going to make this ratio larger. You can reduce the effective number of permits. And you're, what we're really trying to do is move us closer to the first best. That adjustment is going to try to move us closer to the first best. Even though we can't quite get there, we're going to try to get as close as we can. And I'll just show you some numerical results here for the Susquehanna. So this is for a baseline case here, for the first best outcome where I said that uh, uh, the risk is, uh, this ratio here is set at two. The trade ratios, oh, I'm sorry, this is different levels of risk. So we go from 1.5 to, this was our baseline that I was showing you graphs for before, and we go clear up to seven. You can see in all of these cases, the first best trading ratio is less than one, which means um, that non-point abatement is risk reducing at the margin. If we have a 25% increase in our permits, you can see that the op in the second best case, the trade ratio is less than one, less than one. It's only after we get up to uh, about a risk ratio of four that we get up to one. And we can go clear up to seven and we're still at 1.86. That's still less than the existing uh, trade ratios that you see out there. Now, if I increase the, the 
an efficient number of permits by 50, up to 50%, 50% too large, you'll see that all my ratios now become greater than one. Um, and we get really into the two to three range here where we're at uh, five to six for this risk ratio. The reason you don't see the uh, T increasing so much in the first best outcome is because of this permit response. You can see as, as the ratio of the risk increases, <coughs> the permits respond and get larger as we showed in that graph before. And that's having an offsetting effect that the T doesn't have to do as much. As I mentioned, it's really only when you have um, significant abatement risk or highly excessive permit levels that we end up in this two to three range in practice, or that would be optimal. So in practice, given that we're under-regulating, I mean, it could be optimal if the risk is, is, is up in this range. As I said, hydrologists don't think it's really all that high. But if it was, because it, it would happen because we have too many permits. It wouldn't be because we have too much risk, necessarily. It's because we have too many permits combined with the risk. So take home points. Efficiency of the trading, uh, permit train depends on the program design. We need to focus on instruments and trading ratios, or permit levels and trading. Risk is endogenous. It's going to depend on how much abatement we have by non-point sources as influenced by the program management. And absent any permit management, um, we're going to see that the abatement responses are going to differ quite a bit. The social net benefits can be quite different without an abatement response, uh, without permit management. Trade ratio has to do multiple choices and these ratios greater than one might be justified but more related to this lack of a permit response and the fact that we have way, maybe way too many permits out there. So. I would probably need more information about, about these terms. As I said, sort of anecdotally, Oh, how many, how, sorry, how many, how many more permits? I don't know. Um, honestly, I haven't, I haven't really thought to look at that part of it yet. Right. Yeah, no, and it would be, an e you know, that's a good point. It would be an easy thing to do to go back to, um, to look at how much, how much has been permitted by point sources and just to see what the model's predicting. Yeah, we, we didn't think to do that for this, but we probably should have. This paper was a beast. It actually, so, so you guys are gonna be doing research and um, this is a really contentious thing. I mean, if you wouldn't think point non-point trading is that big of a following, but uh, we went through four rounds of revisions in AJE for this paper. And it was, it was mostly, you know, they wanted to see different things, see things expressed in different ways. And, and it, there had not been sort of a framework for analyzing things. I mean, coming up with these curves, nobody had ever tried to put, put trade-offs into these sort of curves before. Uh, what they sort of did in the past was sort of, was again, just focus on equilibrium conditions. And, and nobody really thought about what it means to marginally increase or decrease T and how that would provide costs or benefits. So coming up with a way that people agreed would be a, a good exposition uh, was not easy among three reviewers. So it's really frustrating, but um, yeah, the review process is not always easy, but we, so we didn't ever think about this partly because we we're always trying to respond to so many other things. I wish the reviewer had asked us of that, asked us to do that, it would have been fun. This is a much simpler, so any questions at all? I should ask, if you guys have any questions, and he's, huh? Yeah. 
I don't, I don't think so. Uh, we haven't done it dynamically. When we started this work, so we're looking at, I say nutrients, we're basically looking at nitrogen here, our simulation. Nitrogen is much less dynamic in many settings than like phosphorus would be. Phosphorus is, is much more persistence in the environment. Now they are finding that nutri nitrogen as well is, does have persistence, uh, especially when you get into these coastal areas where you have hypoxic, hypoxic zones. So it is, it is increasingly recognized as important. Um, so, but I, I don't think it's going to change the, the basic results that you're still trying to sort of, you know, you have this long run damage. The, so the damages then would be more of a long run thing. And um, you still got risk. And the question is, you know, what, um, how are you allocating between cost savings and risk? I think there's still a trade-off there. And that's really what we're trying to show here. Mm -hmm. No, no, we did, we, we did that the whole, it threw, that, was, that was to help us too, to draw some graphs, to kind of see what was going on. No, no, so there was a, so Jim Shortle is at Penn State. He's been heavily involved with the Susquehanna River Basin Commission. They're, they're, they're actually, they have a trading program. And um, they, Jim actually convinced them to have a ratio that was around one. EPA got on their backs and said, no, you've got to bring that up to about two and a half. So now they're going to go up to two and a half. But but they've done a lot of research for the EPA at Penn State. And so they had just a few years ago came out with a huge uh, study uh, that looked at source of, of emissions, non-point. They developed marginal cost curves for those sources, acts and, and damage costs. They developed damage curves for the, for the but based on the pollution coming out of the subject. We used all that information. Yeah, so this, I make up a lot of data and stuff and functional forms. This is something we did, we did try to use what they had. Yeah. They're really, the EPA is really focused on what do they get from the trade in terms of control. They know what they're getting from point sources in terms of control. They're not sure what they're getting from non-point sources. But there's, and exactly. So, so what they're doing really is they're, it's a framing problem. It's a framing problem for risks. They're not thinking of existing risks. They're thinking of new risks only. And all the other risks that currently exist in the system, they, they ignore it. They, they, they do, but I'll, I will say, I will say hydrologists haven't done a lot of research into, into uncertainty and the variability. There's been very few studies. And then Penn State, they did not have the, the information on the, on the variation. Because what they use is these long run steady state models. And it's all based on mean effects. Because they don't think that risk is important necessarily <clears throat> as long as over the long run, they're averaging out to what they think they should have. Risk is only Im important in this context economically because the damages are going up and down, right? So they've had no reason to think about it before. So part of the reason for showing this, for having these results too, is to try to communicate to hydrologists that they need to start thinking about risk, the variability. So, and so that's why, you know, we won't stop with AJA. We'll think about, we've, we've published all of our stuff in, in Journal of Water Resources Research, or Journal of, during the American Water Resources Association, water resources research, you know, places where the hydrologists might actually see it and under, start to understand that risk is important. Anything else?
So this one, I think, hopefully will go quicker. This is a new paper. This is something, <coughs> actually, I just got the first real draft to my co-authors on Friday. And, uh, but I really wanted to present it here in part because this is sort of like where trading started, right? Crocker was like the, the father of permit trading. So I thought this would be cool to present here and maybe get a little bit of feedback. But, um, and this is not a point non-point problem, so it's a lot simpler in terms of the math, but I think it's related to what I just showed you. And, and really, and this is, so getting back to doing research, what I showed you is really complicated. But what got us interested in thinking some more about some things, so we, we went from this paper to even a more complicated paper where we were looking at combining trade permit markets across air and water. Because water markets, people, uh, agricultural sources will invest in abatement, but that abatement has, also has air quality impacts. There's a jointness in production. And so we said, well, you know, could you trade across media? And there's been some talk about cross-media trading. So we developed some, some model of cross-media trading. And one of the results that we found that we thought was really interesting in that really complicated model is that um, there were some cases where we assumed perfect mixing of pollutants, which means the damage is just depend on the simple sum of pollutants. Right? We're assuming everybody has the same marginal impact on, the, on damages. But we found cases where the trading ratio was not one-to-one. -one. We thought, well, that's really interesting. And we thought, why is that? Is that because of some risk or something? Or was it because of the cross-media effects? That was because of this term right here. So we thought, well, let's make things simpler. And so we canceled out this term. So what I'm going to do in the next paper is actually not going to have any risk, which makes it a whole lot easier to think about. But this term is going to arise. And it made me think about trading in a way I hadn't thought about it before. So I hope, hopefully you'll find this interesting. And maybe at the end you'll just say, this is ridiculous. And nobody will ever do this. But I think this has some, some merit. All right, so Carson here, we've added him. He is, he's working with me on the cross-media stuff. He's a former grad student. He's out Western. And actually, uh, yeah, he's a, yeah, he's a Western. Uh, Western Michigan University. So cap and trade is a great concept. It's easy to implement. You just set the cap. Then you distribute the permits or allowances in some way. You can auction them off. You can just give them away, whatever. And then you allow trading. And if there's no transactions costs associated with trading, everything's going to work out to a nice equilibrium. Under textbook assumptions, one-to-one uh, -one trading is going to satisfy the cap at minimum abatement cost. And if that cap is efficient, you're going to get the first best outcome. Really simple. If the cap is inefficient, the conventional wisdom is that the market equilibrium still achieves the cap at least social cost. So when I think when I'm talking about social costs, I'm not just talking about minimum abatement costs, I'm also thinking about like damages. Conventional wisdom is that even if you can't, um, have an efficient cap, at least you're meeting the cap at the, at, the, at the best possible cost and the cap is sort of setting the damages. And so that's fixed. And so you're still at least social cost. Well, our question here is, can we improve on cap and trade? when emissions caps are inefficiently lax. As I mentioned in the water quality problem, caps are typically pretty lax and they're exogenous to these markets. It's also the case for many air quality problems. Um, you know, I don't think all these typos are me because um, I've noticed if I go back and forth between different versions, things change and I know I spelled Mendelssohn right. So anyway. I'll take some blame, but not everything is me. Uh, EPA, if you look at air quality problems, EPA is pr prohibited from considering the benefits and costs when setting national air standards, right? So, so if you take that <coughs> the caps are inefficient to begin with because they can't consider the benefits and costs, then let's think about how can we maybe improve on the efficiency of these permit markets. We find there actually improvements can be made. Um, and we're going to use program parameters that may be typically taken for granted. And this is going to be related to Lipsy and Lancaster's theorem of the second best. So I mentioned the theorem of the second best before, sort of. I didn't mention Lipsy and Lancaster. Uh, 
But what it basically says is the second best optimum is generally going to require a departure from other optimality conditions. So when you think about second best pricing, you get these adjustment terms in there. That's what we're going to find here. So we're going to make this as easy as possible. Emissions are costlessly observable. They're deterministic. They're, they're uniformly mixed. Uh, trading is free of transactions costs. And we're going to into two groups that we're going to treat as aggregate polluters. We're going to index polluters by I, say I is equal to one or two. So we have sector one, sector two. Um, the sorting is going to be based on marginal abatement costs. It's going to be done to ensure that polluter one is a buyer and polluter two is a seller in the second best market. But I'm going to just delay the discussion a bit about how sorting relates to marginal abatement costs until we actually get to the second best market. Just for now, what's important is to know that polluter one is going to be, this can be set up so polluter one is a buyer and polluter two is a seller. You know, it doesn't really matter at this point. We just need to designate one as a buyer and one as a seller. So this should look very similar to what we had before, but maybe a lot simpler abatement. Uh, I've changed the notation here a little bit. Sorry about that. This is what's in the paper. Abatement is A. It's just their unregulated emissions minus their new emissions. Abatement costs. Uh, if I substitute this relationship in for A, I get the cost as a function of emissions, just the difference between unregulated and new emissions. I'm going to try to work with emissions here because then I can relate back to environmental standards and it's a little bit easier to graphically illustrate things. Benefits of, of this is A here is total abatement. Uh, this is just the benefits of pollution control. You can think of it as reduced damages, just like we had before. I'm going to use the function B here for benefits. The decentralized market is going to be very much like I set up previously. Two classes of permits. We're going to call them class one and class two, associated with each of these sectors that we have. Sources may hold type permits of each type, and within uh, a, cl a, cl a class, these trades are going to occur at a one to one rate, just like with the point non point trading. The market is competitive. What I don't have up on here is that trading between classes is going to occur at a rate T. We're going to have a trading ratio. So we typically don't even think about trading ratios with this sort of textbook um, pollution problem, but I'm going to have the trading ratio just for the heck of it. See what happens. And it'll be just like before. Um, so if you want to think about firm polluter two is sort of like the non-point polluter in this model. That's what it is. The trading ratio per, uh, what do I have here? Polluter one is a buyer, it's sort of like the point source. Polluter two is a seller, it's like the non-point source. The trading ratio defines how many permits a polluter one has to buy from polluter two. That's all. Polluter type I's post-trade abatement costs look the same as before. Abatement costs plus their net permit purchases, uh, the, value, the value of those net permit purchases. So it's either a cost if they buy more emissions, be a cost for a polluter one and be a, a benefit for polluter two through their sales. And there's my trading ratio. The trading ratio is just the, the change in those number of class two permits required to increase polluter one's emissions by one unit. The market equilibrium looks just like we had before, uh, but it's a little simpler now. So the trading ratio is just the ratio of marginal costs. It's also the price ratio for the permits. P1 and P2 are the prices for the different permits. Market clearing, again, we have our supply of permits on this side and our, our uh, emissions on this side. And again, I've scaled everything so that we're, the denomination here is in terms of class one permits. So we divide by, by T, we divide class two permits by T so that everything's in the same units. If we solve these conditions simultaneously, we're going to get a response function, depends on T and, and, and the permit level. And again, we get this idea that um, the marginal change in E1, as T increases, is going to be negative. Um, 
or alternatively that abatement is, dec is declining, or I'm sorry, abatement is increasing in this case, because if, if you require them to buy more permits from, from firm two, class two, then it's more expensive for them to trade, they're gonna trade less, and that means they have to emit less. This, this response function is ambiguous in sign again due to that, in, due to that endowment effect. And for much of what we're gonna be talking about, the range of values, we're gonna assume this is positive over, the, over many of the range of values that we're dealing with. Again, this is the endowment denominated in class one permits. Uh, we're gonna interpret the market clearing condition here. Hat not sum of at one plus e hat two, just the sum of those endowments. I've just rewritten things a little bit here. So if you just do the math, plug this, this sum in for here, you'll see that it becomes the endowment that we saw on the previous slide. Things simplify. <coughs> but it's useful to put it in this form. You'll see that the market clearing condition defines the locus of possible equilibrium outcomes. When you trade, this condition is gonna to have to hold. You can think of this as a socially defined budget constraint. Um, wealth depends on the relative value of these permanent endowments. So if this is sort of our wealth on this side, um, a change in T is gonna affect the relative permit prices and the value of that endowment. It has those dual effects that we talked about before. So here's the T, if I change it, it changes my effective endowment. If we were to graph this budget constraint, we graph this on this, this graphing it by M, on this axis here, E2, uh, the it intersects here, this is the value of the permanent endowment denominated in terms of class two permits. This is the value of the endowment denominated in class one permits. So this is what I had on the left-hand side of that previous budget constraint equation. And if we solve when E1 is zero, this is what we get on the other side. The equilibrium occurs where this is a, an ISO, ISO cost curve and is tangent to this um, budget constraint and we get our equilibrium values of E1 and E2. And notice the change in T here is gonna affect two things. It changes the intercepts, both intercepts <coughs> depend on T and it changes the slope. The slope of this budget line is, is negative T. So if you think of the absolute value, absolute value of the slope of this thing is always gonna be the trading ratio. We interpret the market condition, clearing condition in another way. And again, I'm just taking the same condition, I'm just rearranging things. Now I'm putting the, the emissions levels on the left-hand side. And you can think of this first term as the pre-trade cap. Again, this was the sum of the permanent endowments when you don't weight things. This is the effective cap, the whole thing is the effective cap in the trading outcome because our, the simple sum of emissions has to equal this, right? So that becomes the cap on the aggregate emissions. You'll see the effective cap and the pre-trade cap are equal when T is equal to one. If T is equal to one, this term vanishes and it's just this term and this term. When T is not equal to one, the effective cap is endogenous because now it's gonna depend on E2. E2 is over here. And as we change E2, cap changes. And in particular, um, the effective cap is gonna be less than the pre-trade cap whenever T is greater than one. So if T is greater than one, this term is one over something bigger than one, it becomes uh, less than one, one minus that is positive. This is the net sales of permits by polluter two, we've assumed that's positive. We've assumed polluter two is gonna be a net seller of, of permits. And so we're taking the pre-trade cap and we're subtracting off the term. So the effective cap gets reduced when T is greater than one. 
since this is in just another representation of that budget constraint, this means the budget constraint represents the effective cap. Right? It's the same equation. We just change things around and call them different things. But since we can say that that equation sort of represents the effective cap, the budget constraint at least depicts the, the effective cap somehow. I'll get back to that in a minute when we show you the graph. Uh, how do changes in T affect the effective cap? Well, since the effect, if, assuming an equilibrium where this is equal to this, this is the effective cap, we could just as easily take the derivative of, this, of these two terms here. And we know what the response of those two terms is in a market equilibrium. And I can derive this equation here based on those uh, permit response or the, yeah, the emissions responses. And we get a price effect and we get an endowment effect. For T equals one, the cap becomes more stringent and emissions decline. So if T is equal to one, uh, this term disappears, the price effect goes away and all we're left with is the endowment effect. And that endowment effect is negative. So if T is equal to one, then as you increase T from that point, then your emissions should decline. Which is essentially what we saw in the previous thing when I said if T is greater than one, the cap should decline. Um, for T greater than one, the emission should continue to, to decline as long as that endowment effect dominates. It could be that at some point the price effect starts to dominate, but at least initially, this should be a range where uh, total emissions declines as, as T goes up. Now let's look at the regulatory problem. So we have social net benefits as our benefits of abatement minus our cost of abatement. And I'm going to maximize this subject to an environmental standard. So suppose the government has gone out and they've already said, here's the standard, right? Um, E1 plus E2 is less than or equal to some standard. This thing has been set exogenously. It's not optimal, not first best. Um, and we're going to assume the standard is too lax, that uh, it's going to be greater than the efficient value of some of emissions. Um, uh, this term here, phi, is your policy choice set. In the first best case, we're going to be choosing T and the level. Traditional markets, uh, in traditional markets, actually in this case, there would be no policy choices. We would set T equal to one. It's sort of been preordained that T should equal one. It's all trading occurs one to one. And um, uh, the cap is generally chosen, the permit cap, it's generally chosen to be the standard. We have some emission standard out there. We just want to set the total emissions permits equal to that standard. So we don't really have anything to maximize in that case. The second best case, we're going to say, let's again assume that the total emissions permit should equal the standard. Let's, let's let us choose T. Let's no longer take for granted that T should be equal to one. Let's, let's choose T, see what happens. Yeah, and this is just emphasizing that in both of these cases, the pre-trade permit levels are equal to the standard. I'm not going to impose that in the first best, but I will impose that for the traditional markets in the second best. So I'm going to look at all three of these markets. I'll start with the first best. It's just like before. Um, we want to set marginal abatement costs equal to the marginal benefits of abatement and set T equal to one. And what we find is that um, here's our environmental standard. It's down here because we're assuming it's going to be exceed the emissions, the optimal level of emissions, the first best level. First best level occurs here where this budget constraint with M, or market clearing condition, uh, is tangent with this ISO cost curve. And also, it turns out this uh, market clearing condition here we have a slope of negative one in both of these cases. Uh, the slope of negative one means that the ISO benefit curve is also uh, at that point. So we have uh, 
iso cost curve, iso benefit curve, tangent at A star gives us our efficient emissions levels. And we said by just, just by construction, we've said that um, this is going to be less than the standard. But notice it's always less than the standard. It doesn't matter where you are on this market equilibrium curve. We can, we can define what the endpoints are, and we can graph this curve. It's going to be parallel to this curve S, and it's always going to lie to the interior. So there's never a case where um, this is going to intersect the other curve. You're always going to be overregulated relative to this environmental standard. And so the first best case, in some sense, isn't really politically viable. You know, if they've already chosen the standard based on some political process that sort of abstracts from, ignores economic thought, and they've chosen the standard, there's no way an economist is going to come in and tell them the E star is better, and that even though your standard's here, we should really be here. Nobody's going to go along with, you know, over-regulating. They're going to view it as over-regulating because the standard's already been set here, and that you're going to make firms in incur too many costs. If you allow, if you make them go to this point. So let's look at the second best market, where we're going to impose again that the permit caps are equal to the standard. So now I've just rearranged, I've taken this equation before. This is the effective permit cap on this side. Total emissions equals the effective permit cap. We're going to The environmental standard now can only be satisfied in a market equilibrium when T is greater than one. Since this, this term is positive and, and if we have a negative sign here, we have to have T greater than one for this whole term to be positive so that total emissions might be less than the standard when we get done. Now, this is total emissions in a market equilibrium. This is not actual regulated emissions. I'm not actually mandating that these emissions be less than the standard. I'm just saying, Let's suppose we regulate emissions equal to the standard and we let people trade and see what they do voluntarily. And, I'm, and what this is telling us is that if T is greater than one, voluntarily we expect them to, to emit less than the standard. This might be politically a little bit more viable. If T is equal to one, This should be positive. We have an interior solution when T is greater than one, strictly greater than one, so that should be positive. And it yields that E1 plus E2 is strictly less than the standard. We get a corner solution involving the traditional market with T equal to one when E1 plus E2 is just equal to the standard. So if this is equal, then we have to have this term vanish. We'd never want to have a case where T is less than one here because then this whole term becomes positive and it tells us the total emissions would exceed the standard and that would not be allowed. So we either get an interior solution or a corner solution. An interior solution is going to, again, require that this um, um, total emissions, if we're assuming an interior solution, they should be less than zero uh, for an increase in T in the neighborhood of T is equal to one. So if starting at T is equal to one, and you increase T a little bit, we should expect emissions to fall in the market solution. And if that's the case, then, um, and then this, the interior solution might be viable. And so for that to happen, the endowment effect has to dominate the price effect. So of course this implies larger abatement costs because now you're having people abate more, but in return, you're gonna get larger benefits. And what we're trying to do here is move closer to that efficient equilibrium. I mentioned that before, but I didn't really show you that, but here I'm gonna show you that. So here's the second best uh, permit. Uh, should be the second best trade ratio. Man, I'm bad today. T star, T double star, the second best trade ratio. It should say permit market. I don't think this, I swear, when I do things on different versions, it, it, things miss, get missing. It used to change all my symbols. I used to go from one computer to another and all my symbols would change. And I'd have Greek letters and they would change to things like, I don't know what they were. Yeah, hearts and clubs. I might bring my laptop tomorrow. Um, T is equal to one. This is the first best ratio. Plus, now we have an adjustment term. 
And again, we see this idea that there's a wedge between marginal benefits and marginal costs. This term here is positive. This is just the net permit purchases by polluter one, which we said polluter ones should permit to purchase. We're just setting it up that way. And this term here, we've already said DE1, DT is negative, but I have a negative sign. This is positive. So the sign of this adjustment term depends on this. So again, the adjustment term arises because we're now managing two things, the relative permit prices and the effective cap. This is consistent with Lipsy and Lancaster's results on second best pricing. And the adjustment term is gonna be positive here since the standard is two lakhs. We have a lakh standard, marginal benefits of abating should be higher than the marginal costs. And that means a corner solution should not arise. We should actually expect a value of T that's greater than one in this case. So before, with, because of risk, I was arguing, I kept arguing smaller ratios are good. But we said a larger ratio might occur in the second best case than would be efficient because of this wedge term. And now I'm finding we get rid of risk altogether. The wedge term is still here and it's driving our ratio up greater than one relative to the efficient case. So we can compare second best in traditional markets. Let B double star and C double star equal the second best benefits and costs. BT and CT are the benefits and costs of a traditional market where we just have one-to-one -one trading. Same cap in both cases. We can find that when the pollution standard is two lakhs, we get an increase in benefits, we get an increase in costs, but the increase in benefits outweighs that increase in costs. And so the second best market is more efficient than the traditional markets. I call this a proposition, it's really the kind of the results of what we've just been talking about. But here's the crazy graph. So here's the environmental standard, ES. Now in a traditional market, the traditional budget curve has gotta be set up so that you always achieve the environmental standard. So that traditional market clearing curve or budget curve, whatever you wanna call it, is gonna lie along that same environmental standard. It's gonna have a slope of, of, of negative one. Here we have an ISO cost curve that's gonna be tangent to that standard at AT. AT is our traditional market clearing equilibrium. We can, you can, you can use the uh, market clearing condition to define the uh, endpoints and they're written in terms of the environmental standards. So this one has ES minus this term. We've already said T is gonna be greater than one. So we're gonna be subtracting something off. So here's ES, our new intercept should be below ES. And up here, we have ES plus a term. We have a t, t minus one, this is bigger than one, so this has to be above ES. So this curve is going to um, start off above, come down, it's gonna have to cross, and where it crosses is gonna be at, um, the initial permit allocation. Because by definition, we've said that the initial permit allocation is gonna lie on that curve. And that the initial permit allocation has to be equal to ES. So they have to cross at that initial permit allocation. So there's where we're at for the initial allocation. The rest of this then would be the viable uh, trading locus of trades. Along this, along this market clearing condition. We couldn't trade up here because that would give us, uh, we'd exceed the standard. So we could trade along here along a corner solution, but otherwise we'd wanna trade along this curve. And we see that this curve is tangent to an ISO cost curve at A star, A double star. And you can see that that lies in the interior of, 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 of this one. So what we've done here is we've, we found the same initial allocation as we would have had for traditional markets. But a traditional market, and this satisfies the environmental standard for both cases. We're telling firms you have to meet the environmental standard initially. But after you meet it initially, we're gonna allow you to trade. Or instead of meeting it, you can trade. And by allowing people to trade on the traditional curve only, they're gonna be on here, but by having a different trading ratio, they're gonna voluntarily move in here to a better outcome. This wouldn't be over-regulation. People can still choose to be up here. They voluntarily moved to be down here. 
So when I talked about sorting before, I think I'm missing, oh, here it is. So I drew this, I happen to draw this allocation up here at this point up here, uh, where you're giving more permits to firm two than to firm one. There was, and we said that it had to happen because we wanted firm two to be the net seller of permits. So they have, the trading has to occur sort of in this direction. So we're gonna reallocate the endowment in a sense. Here's the, here's the, mar the traditional market endowment, but we're gonna be up here someplace and um, trade in down to there. Now, who would you want to be firm two? That's the question. We haven't said yet who should be firm one or firm two, sector one, sector two. We've only said the endowment starts up here. So think about just a mental exercise. Suppose you did start here and you reallocated things up in this direction. Who do you want to reallocate it to? Do you want to reallocate it to the high cost firms or the low cost firms? So initially, we have PT, that's our in the traditional market where everybody's equating their marginal abatement costs. Here's the high marginal abatement cost curve. Here's the low marginal abatement cost curve. And this is the abatement for um, the high cost people and for the low cost people. If I give the high cost people more permits, they can abate less. And the cost savings they get are going to be higher than the cost savings you get from doing the same sort of reallocation to the low cost people, right? If I'm gonna move from that efficient equilibrium initially, and give more permits to one group, the group I wanna give them to is these guys because the cost savings to them from that initial allocation is gonna be huge compared to the low cost people. So if I'm gonna give more permits to these guys so they can abate less, in the initial, equal, initial permit allocation, these guys have to be allowed to abate more or have to be made to abate more, so I'm gonna have to give them fewer permits. So I'm gonna call E2 my high cost polluters and E1 my low cost polluters. This becomes my pre-trade environmental standard. This is my second best effective cap. And as you see, the effective cap is reduced. And because we know the first best outcome is somewhere down here, I can't tell you exactly where it is, um, just based on the simple analysis we've done so far, based the, we're being pretty general here, but we do know it's below AT in the interior here. We know that AT is, is closer, a, a double star is closer than AT. If you can imagine a series of isocost curves coming out and some expansion path, we know that this is gonna be closer than that. So this is what I just said before, the standards just satisfied prior to trading, trading lease or volunteer reduction, we get closer to the first best. The second best market may be, efficiency may be further improved by allocating even more permits to the farther we go along this direction, in a sense, the more flexibility we have to adjust the trading ratio to get us uh, closer to the first best. Right? This trading ratio, this, this budget curve here is determined, the slope of that is determined by the trading ratio. If I start off right here and I wanna go to the first best, I really can't have a negative trading ratio taking me in this way. The only thing I can do is have a very uh, steeply sloped curve that might take me straight down and maybe I'll get a point like here, I'm not gonna ever get very close, but the farther I'm up the curve, the more flexibility. Up here at the corner, I can actually, I can use the initial, I can use trading ratio of one, or I can use many other trading ratios that are gonna get me much closer. I have much more flexibility. So the allocation here matters for efficiency. So we do a hypothetical numerical example. So I was asked before about making stuff up. Here I'm making up costs a little bit, but we're assuming quadratic costs. You can think of this as a, an, appro uh, an approximation, a quadratic approximation to the actual cost curve. We're gonna some quadratic marginal costs uh, of this form, where this psi component is just a cost parameter that's gonna differ by polluter. 
So I'm not yet talking about sector one or sector two, I'm talking about the polluters in those sectors. We actually want to allow for some heterogeneity within a sector because we're going to talk about how to, how to construct these sectors. Uh, we're not going to just going to take them as fixed and maybe say half the people are high cost and half are low cost. We don't know which groups are high cost or low cost until we decide what the cutoff point is. We can choose the cutoff point. So this is a cost parameter. Our cost function here just assumes that abatement costs at zero abatement or the marginal cost of zero abatement just equals zero, which is typically assumed. We use a microparameter model to model heterogeneity in psi and to aggregate. And then we're going to choose a value of psi to segment the high marginal abatement cost polluters from the low marginal abatement cost polluters. There's a critical value of this to just break up the groups. And once we break up the groups, then we can aggregate over the groups. And I'm not going to go into a microparameter model. I don't know if you guys have seen microparameter models, but basically what, what it does is Let's say psi hat is my cutoff for the, for the low cost people. So what I would do is I'd have a psi lower bar, which would be the lowest bound for, for my psi. You have your abatement cost function, which is psi abatement squared. And what you assume is there's a distribution of psi. In this case, we just use a uniform distribution, but there's a distribution of psi. And then we just integrate over this range from um, psi lower bar to psi hat. And, and, the, and this is our abatement cost. So we're integrating abatement costs, weighting it by the distribution of, oops, this is a psi, not a gamma. Weighting it by the size and what we're doing is then is we're getting the aggregate abatement cost for this group. For this would be for the low cost group. We can do the same thing for the high cost group. This thing here, our cutoff can be effectively a choice variable. I'm not going to show you the optimality conditions for that, but I'll show you some simulation results where we change that value. So our baseline assumptions for numerical examples, we're actually going to put, just go ahead and for, just for the heck of it, we're going to put 70% the low cost sector, call them polluter one. 50% of the permits will just be allocated to each polluter group, each sector. We have to have some measure of heterogeneity. So I mentioned we have psi, psi is gonna be in the bounds of psi lower bar to psi upper bar. And we're gonna then choose some value to cut off for the different groups. But within the, for this uh, range, we got to choose how big that range is, how much heterogeneity there is. And what we're just assuming is that the maximum value psi had is five times the, the minimum value here. We'll look at different values of that, but just to see if heterogeneity plays much of a role. Here's our numerical results. So the unregulated case, boy, you can barely see it's cut off. This is our, so we have net benefits, split them up into benefits and costs. You can see the abatement by sector in millions of metric tons of, of uh, carbon equivalents. We did count, so we did have a, 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 I should say, we have a quadratic benefit function, quadratic cost functions. We did calibrate those functions based on values from the literature um, to at least sort of get a rough aggregate abatement costs and damage functions. You know, it's a, it's a sort of a crude model, but it is calibrated to sort of represent some, you know, somewhat realistic numbers. Um, trade ratio in the unregulated case, there is none because you're not regulating. And the effect of emissions, this is sort of our baseline where we're starting for if we don't abate anything, is about 7,300 million metric tons of CO2. This is for the US. This is the value that came out of an MIT study for climate change. First best case, you can see we produce $39 uh, billion dollars in benefits or net benefits. Here's the benefits and costs. You can see that the low cost group sector one is abating the vast majority of emissions. The sellers are abating uh, considerably less. Roughly, what is that? About a third of, of this. And the effect of emissions has fallen from 7,300 down to about 50, almost 5,600. So considerable drop in emissions 
of, I can say effective. This is just total emissions when we're done. We just count up total emissions. Now we say, what happens if you had a standard at 115% of that first best level? So we just increased it a bit more. What if we're regulating, but we're not quite there at the efficient level? If we have one-to-one -one trading, which is the, sort of the traditional market, our social net benefits go down from 39 million or billion to 29 billion, considerable drop. That's uh, roughly 25%, right? And um, you can see the abatement for the low cost in the, in the, in the sellers all the way across the board, it falls by, by about half. And uh, total, total emissions are about 6,400. So we're about midway between these two values in terms of overall emissions. The second best case, you can see what happens is we choose a, a trading ratio of 2.2. And now a abatement is much closer, at least on the low cost polluters, it's much closer to the efficient level. And the effective emissions, or the total emissions, are slightly above the efficient level. They're about 5,600 here, they're about 5,700 here. So this is just as the, the theory predicted what would happen. So if you compare the traditional market to the second best case, you see about a 34% rise in net benefits. You do get higher costs, but those benefits have increased considerably, so the net benefits have increased a lot as well. And you, as I said, you do get the lower cap, and it's much closer to that first best cap. If we add heterogeneity, we did some sensitivity analysis. We said, what if we add heterogeneity? So before I had that A to equal to five, I, add, I increased it to, to seven. We also looked at de decreasing it. It's only, if you decrease it to one, obviously you get no, there's, there's no value. But it doesn't take much more than about two or three for that eta term to start, for things to start to kind of level out. So if about at seven, you can see the values here are pretty similar. Uh, total abatement values are very similar. Not much, of a, not much of a difference in terms of impacts of more heterogeneity. What if we allocate uh, fewer polluters to sector one? So we talked about allocating how much, how many, where to choose this psi hat cutoff point. How many polluters are put in sector, sector one versus sector two? You can see that relative to the second best, we have a bit of a drop off now. Uh, it goes from 30, almost 39 million down to about 35 million. So that has an effect. I've only increased, I've only changed the allocation of polluters by 10%, but I'm starting to see a, a, an effect. And now the gains from the, from the, from the uh, versus conventional markets has declined from 38% to 21%. Yeah. It's just, I shouldn't have said effective. It's just total emissions. Why they differ across these different scenarios? So you set it up. So I'm sorry, finish. Yes. Yes, this is this this is the standard. We we keep the initial allocation of emissions equal to equal to this in all the cases. But after trading occurs, people trade to fewer emissions because of the trading ratio. So the trading ratio here was 2.2 .2, and they traded down to 5,700. Here, again, this is the same, these are all the same values as we saw up here. You know, it, changing the allocation of polluters to sector one or sector two doesn't matter when you have a one-to-one -one trading ratio. So this one-to-one -one case, Nothing changes. I've just brought the numbers down for ease of comparison. But the second best case gets a little worse as we, as we allocate fewer polluters to the low cost sector. We have to have a larger ratio and uh, our emissions reduction isn't quite as big. Now we're starting to get closer to the, to the standard. 
Yeah. So what this is showing is that changing the allocation of who's in what group, which class, actually matters, right? And finally, we said, what happens if you just gave all permits to sector two? As I mentioned before, we had that, that, that market clearing curve, and we said, you know, if you, if you move farther, closer and closer to giving all the permits to the one sector, you get more flexibility in how much you can shift that ratio around, where you, how close you might get to the first best. And here you see it, if I give all permits to sector two, now the second best case and the efficient are almost identical. And in terms of emissions as well. And the trading ratio is now shrunk down to 1.2. So I'm actually, I'm really closing in on that first best case. I can't ever quite get there, but by changing the allocation and, and also by maybe potentially changing the mix of polluters into the different groups, I can approximate the first best in this market, even though the standard is too high. So what we're doing is we're giving ourselves more tools to work with. Anytime you constrain yourself by having too large of a standard, you, you might wanna look for other tools. If you have more tools, they may not be the most efficient tools, but by using multiple tools, you can sort of approximate or get yourself closer to what that first best would have been. Yeah. Right. Although the more you give them, the more favorable the ratio ends up becoming. So it does. <laughs> no, I agree. There are some definitely some political economy things that you might have to work out. But the basic, the basic idea is that, which I think is, is, is a difficult sell um, in, in, in for, the, for the efficient case, well, the, the efficient case, you know, we, we, we just can't say, here's the standard, but we want the efficient level to be this much lower, so we're just gonna give fewer permits out. That's not gonna fly. But if you give them the same amount of permits initially as they would under any other traditional market, and then just give them the, the option to voluntarily move from that based on this ratio, you haven't imposed any restrictions on them. They're still allowed to stay where they were but they, they do benefit, there are gains from trade. So in all these cases, there are gains from trade. Doesn't matter how you allocate the permits, you know, and you could come up with a, an allocation rule that says, you know, maybe you give a refund lump sum back to some group. So we give all the permits to the high cost people, but at the end of the day, you know, we have some sort of a transfer mechanism to, to lump sum refund some of the low cost people to compensate them. Other questions? You guys are really quiet. Yeah. If you're below the first best, um, for the standard, then uh, I don't think it would be politically viable to do something like this because what you'd be doing is you'd be allowing people to trade and violate the standard, right? If you're, I think what would happen is, at least conceptually, if you, if you mandate that you have to be at the standard, um, that you can't violate the standard, then the, the, the trading ratio would just be one. You'd be at a corner solution and you just stay at that trading ratio of one. That, yeah, that's a good question though. We, it's something we definitely look, thought about, but it wouldn't be viable. So this only works in the one case where you're under-regulated. But I think many part problems we see are under-regulated. About to become increasingly more so, I think. 
the pollution standards generally set by, by scientists, you know, government scientists, or they work in conjunction with, with maybe academics, but they're usually thinking about health issues, not economic values necessarily, but health issues. And, you know, what standard do we need for good health? And uh, in, in, in not in all cases, some cases you might see overregulation, but in many cases, the evidence is, it's, uh, some studies have suggested that they're under regulation, under regulation is going on. I think so. You don't have to give all of them. What we're saying is that you could do better by giving them all. Yeah. There's other mechanisms that you could come up with that like I'd start off with 50 50 and still get better. Right? I mean, that was the first scenario up here that the, the baseline was 50 50. We still went from uh, 6,400 in the traditional market to 5,700 in the new market. Right. Could be. All right. Well, sorry to keep you so long today. Tomorrow will not be nearly as long, I hope. And Thursday will definitely be shorter. Thank you.